are the barriers to communication can we see? Very often we can see language barriers. We need to be prepared when we know a particular client is coming, arrange for the interpreter. And quite often I see that the interpreters have, are not there in court and the whole process has been slowed down. We already talked about privacy and confidentiality. But another aspect is, these are individuals who've been charged, they've been humiliated because of a mental illness, and they need to be approached with respect and sensitivity. And quite often we are so rushed, we forget about the individual. It's about the individual. I've talked to some of the judges in the Crown. So fitness to stand trial surprisingly has not been a big problem because it's easily picked up, quickly picked up, and it's brought to the attention and assessed by the psychiatrist here. So it might sometimes take up to a week because the psychiatrist who does the fitness to stand trial assessments is here once a week. Quite often we have issues related to criminal responsibility, but more simple client, and that's where I like to focus on. My client who killed himself is not the first client who killed himself within the criminal justice system. And the reason, one reason that I can talk about is that we as a group sometimes see individuals coming before us in court as having committed an antisocial act. And we forget that these individuals might actually be hurting on the inside. These individuals may have a lot of aggression, and when they're contained, the aggression may be redirected inward. So suicide is a real risk factor in some of these individuals who are released and they come to us and we do a quick examination. Sometimes you need to spend more time with some of these individuals. So both the risk to self and risk to others is important. The risk to others is often picked up early because of the aggression, but the risk to self is sometimes missed, especially when there's a mental illness at the bottom. The need for legal representation to ensure that the case is dealt with in a timely manner and justice is done for the mentally ill is extremely important. And we know now that uh, legal aid is sometimes not offered to clients who have charges that might not net them jail time. But isn't that a disservice to the mentally ill who are already struggling to find work and with criminal <coughs> records it becomes less likely for them to find work? It brings me back to a time when I read Askov and Moran, two cases before the Supreme Court where delays in the court process can prejudice an individual's mental health. But what about a mentally ill person? To me, that's a double prejudice if there's a delay. I just again want to highlight, in any given year, there are about 200,000 homeless people in Canada. And this statistic I got in April 2014 from the Mental Health Commission of Canada. About 50% of these 200,000 people have mental illnesses. Big inner cities like Toronto are likely to have more homeless people than small towns and cities. <coughs> what are some of the common mistakes made by lawyers and, and mental health professionals when dealing with the mental illness in court? Often there are con there's confusion around the issue that mental illness is synonymous with unfitness of criminal responsibility. Sometimes there's confusion as to personality disorders, intoxication, and transient mood states are linked with unfitness. There's a failure to look at the strict cognitive test for fitness, but also the converse. So just recently, a case was referred to me where this individual had pled guilty to some charges. And then when I assessed him, he was clearly unfit to stand trial. He had no clue what he had even pled guilty to. And unfortunately, he had been sitting in jail for a long period of time because people said, well, he knew he was pleading guilty and he wanted to get out quickly, but he was unfit. So it puts lawyers in a bit of a bind. What do you do when the client wants to plead and yet is unfit? Failing to examine the issue of moral wrongfulness is another problem that we see when they can, the people confuse it with legal wrongfulness. Confusing psychiatric issues are also seen related to intent, specific intent, and criminal responsibility. One of the problems that we have from time to time is failure to provide adequate disclosure to the evaluator. That slows the process down. Being focused on the diagnosis and not how the illness actually impairs functioning is an important point to determine. And quite often we stop at diagnosis rather than look at to what degree is the illness impacting on functioning. Not having forethought with respect to the outcome of unfitness of criminal responsibility and guilty pleas and potential negative outcomes in the long run. Failing to spend adequate time talking about the case with the parties involved prior to and during the legal process. 
they need to spend time asking the client and the client's family what really is wanted about this legal process. Before I finish, I want to talk a little bit about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. This convention was held in 2006, and there's a document. Section E of the document says that, he, that there is no single definition of disability, and it, this convention does not recognize the primacy of the social model. They talk about disability as an evolving concept, and that disability results from the interaction between persons with impairment and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. Look at the chart that follows after that. If you can just put the chart. Yes. I found this a very useful chart because <coughs> we have already marginalized the individual. And they talk about, the United Nations talks about treating individuals as charity cases where the ch person has an option as to how he's going to plead or she's going to plead. They're totally disempowered and they have external, external controls placed on them either by the courts or by the psychiatric profession. Whereas the human rights approach sees it as an obligation. It's a disability. We need to look at how we can empower the individual and create some sense of autonomy. The charity approach looks at fixing the weakness, limiting activity, and in a way belittles the individual. Whereas the human rights approach focuses on fixing the environment, facilitating activity, and treating the person with the dignity. The charity approach focuses on, on dependence, discrimination, institutionalization, and segregation, either to the hospital or to jail. Whereas we, from a human rights approach, focus on how we can create more independence, equality, inclusion, and inclusion. As one of the judges I recently spoke to said, if only we could go beyond the adversarial approach with the mentally ill, we can move the wheels of justice much faster. And in fact, when we sit at one or two courts in the old city hall, we see that sometimes there's a loosening of the adversarial process. Let me just conclude the talk by saying that while we are caught in a web of emails, text messages, voicemails, and struggle to bridge the communication gap with court officials, mental professionals, and all connected players, we also are wrestling with our own trials and tribulations of day-to-day -day living. We cannot forget about how we communicate with ourselves about the conflicting views of mental disability and its many meanings. I hope that I've been able to put you in a frame of mind and uh, allow you to have your own discourse with yourself. Thank you. question that you're asking because there's going to be an inquest. <laughs> okay. Um, sure. The question was, is there anything else that we could have done about the client who killed himself? With hindsight, there's all the things that you can the client more often. You can liaise with the psychiatrist on the other side more often. We can have a, an alternate case manager to go out and visit the client. Uh, but it's like having a crystal ball and predicting all variables. Sometimes there's a limit. You talked about privacy when you were when you were um, at the at the beginning. Uh, you know, you went through safety, security, privacy, trust. Uh, I was curious about privacy because obviously um, privacy is important. It's a bit of an issue. Do you have any suggestions about? Uh, how we can deal with that issue in a court setting. My experience is that duty, sorry. The <laughs> question is how can we deal with privacy in the courtroom setting? My experience is that duty counsel is most important or the defense lawyer is most useful because clients at least have a greater degree of trust in their counsel. So if the counsel can advise the client the degree to which information can be released, that would be the best. 
we find that clients come to our office and say, well, I can't talk to you about that because my lawyer said not to talk to anybody about anything. So that was, is the starting point. I talked to some of the probation officers and other individuals in the courtroom, and they say that if you have the release forms in the courtroom, clients might be willing to release information, at least of a restricted nature, and that information can be easily passed back and forth within the courtroom itself. So keeping uh, release forms handy and available might actually speed up the process. I, I just noticed that we have a, a question from someone online uh, just asking for a clarification of what the social model is. <clears throat> the, the question is what is the, what is the social model? I guess there is no single model for mental illness and social proponents for mental illness talk about adverse life experiences, lack of housing, low socioeconomic status as contributive to mental illness. When we look at mental illness as a whole, there's no single reason why people develop mental illness. At one end of the spectrum, we have organic factors and genetic causes. But on the other hand, we have sociological causes. One of the great proponents of sociological causes is Emile Durkheim, who talked about uh, the social origins of suicide. And a, a society that's not cohesive might see actually more suicide in that society. So nobody owns mental illness or mental disorder. And that's why I said even using the word mental illness makes it sound more medical. And we have to contextualize it and look at the multiple social factors, the biological factors, and the psyche of the individual. And that's why the approach in the courts has been, and that's my experience, is to contextualize everyone's problems, not only as a biological problem, but we have ancillary workers who are struggling frantically to find accommodation for individuals. The Mental Health Commission conducted a very intensive program called Housing First, which is in keeping with a model from New York City, where the focus was any mentally ill person approach, uh, uh, approaching an agency is found a combination irrespective of whether they're accepting or not accepting treatment. And once they're placed in their accommodation, then you start putting the services into place, which is almost contrary to what we do. We like to start the treatment first. And they studied, uh, they did the study in five cities across Canada, uh, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, and Moncton. And they have some excellent results that are published on their website from the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And the report just came out in April 2014 saying, and that it's a proposal that that's a model that should be implemented. And in fact, Toronto participated. We got funding from uh, the federal government, the provincial government, and even the local government was involved. So there's a lot of emphasis now on homelessness and poverty as being contributors to crime and mental illness. So it's not that people aren't taking notice. Send them to us. <laughs> it, 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 it actually just happened to you. Sorry. How do you how do you deal with a client who's got a delusion with respect to even the charges? We had a client just today, this morning. This is a young man who believed that his employer was uh, uh, instituting an electronic surveillance on him. So he had some problems relating to his employer. He goes home and he says. And he hits his wife, and he gets charged with a domestic assault. So quite often, the tendency would be to get them into some domestic counseling and things like that. But it's only when we started talking that we realized that the surveillance and the paranoia that he had about his workplace also impacted on his offending with his wife, with him believing that she uh, had some electronic devices hidden in the teddy bears at home that were following him around. So. How that, that, how that behave, how his behavior impacted us is another story. But when he came into my office today and was sitting with Eden, 
he said, Doctor, this has been going on for some time. So we didn't challenge him on that, but we looked around all other issues, and he said, it looks like you've had some problems. You've had some problems with coping with your uh, criminal justice system, coping with your family, coping with work. And so the focus was on, I think you need some time out. Would you like me to fill out your disability form? And that started the ball rolling. As soon as I said that, he said, Doctor, I'm so grateful you said that, because my previous psychiatrist didn't tell me that I could get disability. And then with the disability, I said, and we have certain medication that might ease some of your pain. So once you get the dialogue going, he's already sensed that I'm there to help him. So we built trust. There was a sense of security. And very quickly, we put him on an antipsychotic drug. And I'm going to see him next week. And I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. He will actually be well next week. And then I'll send him back to you. <laughs> And there's no greater pleasure than, you know, assisting somebody who's psychotic the way you described and uh, getting them well enough to get back and communicate with counsel. So, so I guess one of, the, one of the practical issues that we have, you say send the people to us, really often we need to communicate with our clients and get some instructions before we can even decide as defense lawyers um, or duty counsel whether or not you know they want to see you. So how do we how do we start though? I guess from the very beginning. You know, I've always said that lawyers are actually good psychiatrists in their own right. <laughs> After all, 50 percent of the criminal law is about men's rear, and the rest is actors rear. So you study psychology, you understood clients, and you've seen a lot of people in the courtroom. The process is to keep an open dialogue. The more you talk to the client, the more you get them to express themselves, the more you'll pick up as to to what extent is the person fit or unfit. And even if the person fit, does the person, will the person benefit from seeing a psychiatrist to assist in the process? Because not, I would say 95% of all the clients who come to us who are psychotic are also fit to stand trial. <laughs> Just that it makes it more difficult for them to deal with you. So. You as a defense attorney is the first person who can make that decision. It's a value judgment. How ill is the person? Will the person benefit from uh, some assessment or some treatment? It just facilitates and makes the whole process even smoother and faster. So uh, it might be depend on the client's own views, stigma about mental illness. But it might be also the defense lawyer's own stigma, because some lawyers have been afraid of their clients getting labeled as mentally ill and then the NCR issue would get raised, so they try to keep it all under wraps. I think there's a question from a, it was I think from a <coughs> Cornelia Masgarian I saw there. Is it about, has the practice of lawyers changed? Yes. You want to read? Um, Over the years, have you noticed a change in the practice of criminal lawyers in dealing with mental health cases in relation to legal aid on failure of funding? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, have you seen over the years uh, a change in how lawyers on legal aid are handling what, mentally ill individuals? Yeah, with mental health cases in relation to legal aid on federal funding. Yeah, I've seen, a, I've seen a big change. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and I find that lawyers are much, much more knowledgeable about mental illness. Lawyers are quickly in tune now with, uh, with what services are available. So many lawyers are already in tune with the multimodal aspects of managing clients, getting housing in place, getting knowing what their safe beds are. So I think they've moved a long way. I also find that most of the law schools have mental health courses and uh, uh, junior lawyers are being exposed to mental health uh, issues. I've been called often to, uh, to talk to students that ask good about mental health issues and the questions that I hear from uh, young budding lawyers are phenomenal questions about the interface of law and psychiatry. So I think people are moving forward. I, I think, though, I think the question specifically was talking about um, the relationship to legal aid in particular. And, and probably you wouldn't know, that wouldn't be a question necessarily that you would ask, you know, a lawyer, are you, you know, are you taking legal aid on this, on this case? Because I'm not sure that, that Dr. Gosher would be able to well, I, well, if you look at it, most individuals who are mentally ill and come from the lowest stratus of society will invariably be seeking out legal aid lawyers. Mm -hmm. So if the, the wealthy, unless they have a lot of money, they will be hiring psychiatrists on a private basis and then the cost can be quite high. 
So I enjoy doing legal aid because you see some of the most fascinating individuals. You get a great sense of uh, pleasure in trying to rehabilitate them all. But are adverse to treatment. For, for adversity, even acknowledging that it's a problem, how to, how to actually get through to them, seeing whether they're willing to accept different forms of treatment. That's a tricky question because it also depends on the psychiatrist who they see. Uh, there's a tendency for us as psychiatrists to medicate, and we feel that's the most powerful tool that we have. To sit and talk to a client takes time to sit and talk to a client and do a simple non-pharmacological intervention takes time and effort. But I think uh, we have to spend a little more time. In fact, today itself, I was told that the number of hours I have at court have been cut. <laughs> and thinking to myself, does it mean I'm going to prescribe more medication? I don't think so. I think talking to clients, coming up with other alternate solutions, like uh, reconceptualizing their problems, will earn the trust of the client. And once you have the trust, you can later on turn on to them and say, by the way, there's also medication that may help you when you're ready, rather than tell them, look, you are going to take some medication. That's the only way that you're going to get around the system. No, keep an open mind. And that's why I said connecting with the client on the level that the client wants to connect with may be the starting point. So if the client wants to talk about housing, yeah, we'll talk about housing. If the client wants to talk about ODSP, and I'll tell you, the ODSP forms are the greatest way to get to a client, if people know what ODSP is, Ontario Disability Support Plan. Because the client comes to you and has no money, has a major mental illness, and doesn't accept that they have a mental illness. And as I'm talking to the client, I say to the client, I think you've got an illness which is giving you some option of getting ODSP. And before you know it, the client is quite agreeable to you putting a diagnosis of schizophrenia down. As long as they get the ODSP money, even though the client doesn't want to take their medication. And to me, that's okay. At least we're getting, as like the housing first model, we're getting the client connected. The medication will follow eventually. Because I can start the person the medication, the side effects are abominable, and the client might come back and say, I'm not taking your medication again. So I'd rather connect with the client, and with the time, the client will come back and say, Doc, I think I'd like to take some medication. And then you run them over. And not everybody needs medication. Mm -hmm. Is there a medication for all mental illness? There is a pill for every ill, but it's very bitter. There is a pill for every ill, but it's so bitter. I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> Essentially, uh, isn't the question about comparing private uh, counsel and legal aid lawyers, and is, is there a change? And I'm not sure, again, that that's a fair question for you, Dr. Gozier. If you think you can answer it, go ahead. But uh, it's a pretty, pretty tricky question for anyone to answer, I would think, at this point. Uh, I don't know whether you're willing to answer. <laughs> I think a lot of lawyers that take uh, on uh, mental health matters realize that they're not going to get paid for the work they do, and they do it for different reasons. That's what I think. Right, and, and that's true. I've had many lawyers who've had a very difficult time with their clients who are not willing to talk to them. In fact, just today, I saw a client down in the cell who was talking to one of the clients. The client's been already told that he's not going to get bail, and I was asked to go and see the client and do an assessment. And he said, I'm not going to talk to you because I want to talk to my lawyer first. And I can see the lawyer having to go over and over again to see this client, and there's going to be no remuneration for those extra hours put in. But there are some legal aid lawyers who go the extra mile, and kudos to them. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gosher.
And thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we've got some little tidbits from Dr. Gozier that will help us uh, deal with some sometimes challenging clients. I think bottom line is uh, be very careful to get a lot of context and then look for a good doctor.